All right, Dr. McLaughlin, it is an honor interviewing you for a book in spade. If you, if you could just give us a little bit of an introduction of yourself to our listeners. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Uh, I'm Jonathan McClatchy. I currently live in Boston, Massachusetts, where I work as an assistant professor of biology at a Christian college called Sattler College. I recently um, moved uh, from the UK with my wife uh, to Boston. Uh, I um, lived uh, most of my life in the UK, was born, raised there um, in Scotland, uh, did my uh, degrees in the field of biology, uh, so I have a bachelor's degree in forensic biology, and I also have a master's degree in evolutionary biology, and a second master's degree in medical and molecular bioscience, and I did my PhD in evolutionary biology, and I'm also currently working on a Master of Arts degree at Southern Evangelical Seminary in Biblical Studies. So uh, I have a, um, a well-rounded interest in, uh, in natural theology or scientific evidence uh, that points to a creator. And I also am very interested in uh, the um, biblical and historiographical evidence that uh, there's not only a creator, but he specifically revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ and through the Bible as the word of God. I uh, am very interested in particular in the, uh, in, demonstrating the substantial reliability of the biblical accounts, uh, in particular the Gospels and Acts. Uh, I'm also interested in the Old Testament very much as well. I'm especially fascinated by things like Christology and uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament as well as in the New and, uh, and uh, things of that nature. And also, the, um, I, also how Jesus fulfills Old Testament prophecy and some of the, the thread, the messianic threads that run throughout the, the tapestry of the Old Testament, such as corporate solidarity and so forth. So these are some of my interests. Uh, my website for anyone that wants to check out some of my writing and, and videos uh, is uh, jonathanmcclatchy.com. So very simple. Uh, I actually just launched the, the website yet, um, uh, recently. And uh, it's um, and you can find me on YouTube as well. My YouTube channel is Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. So. Awesome. And I've been a big fan of a, Apologetics Academy for a long, long time on YouTube. It's a, an amazing resource to just try to get a better hold of the biblical data and to see the integrity of the Bible from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation chapter 22. Now, you know, Professor McLaughlin, one of the most compelling aspects of your website that I discovered was when I was doing my research into the reliability of the Gospel of John. Uh, I came across, of course, that um, debate between uh, Dr. Craig Evans and Dr. Bart Ehrman, where Craig Evans, who was considered, and, and I think is still considered by many, a conservative figure of, in the evangelical field, ended up denying not only the historicity of the I am statements, but seemed to reduce the Gospel of John to if my memory serves me to a parable or to historical nuggets. And actually, this was very disturbing to me as someone who believes in biblical inerrancy. And so I, I tried to hunt down good, strong counter arguments from a, a strong historical angle. And that led me not only to the work of Dr. Lydia McGrew and Dr. Tim McGrew, but sir, that also led me to your excellent website where you help facilitate uh, that debate between uh, Dr. Lydia McGrew and, of course, Dr. Craig Evans, where they were, were able to hammer out some of those more details. Now, one of the claims that Evans has made in the past uh, was that the voice of Jesus in the synoptics is different from the voice of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Now, uh, Professor McLaughlin, as someone who also holds to the authority of Scripture and believes in the authority of the Bible. How can we best offer a counter argument to this difference in voice? And how might we account for this difference of, of voice? Uh, one aspect of my mind that comes often enough is that when I speak in an academic setting like now, it's a little more formal, uh, it's a little more precise in terms, but if I'm hanging out with my uh, tech buddy Matt in the background at the pub, and I'm grabbing a pint or two, or if I'm with family members, um, naturally, I'm going to be a lot more relaxed and there's going to be a very different tone given my different audience. But, you know, just as uh, a believer and a historian, how do we amount for some of these differences? Yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, you, you, uh, I think what you said is quite correct. Um, and in fact, most of uh, Jesus' teaching in the Gospel of John takes place in Jerusalem, which is where the learned classes congregate and in a synagogue in Galilee. Uh, and so we could argue that, that Jesus gives these more cryptic teachings, which allude to the, the 
Aramaic Targumim um, or the Old Testament. Uh, in the, um, the Aramaic Targumim or Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament uh, for any viewers that aren't familiar with with those. Um, but but these these more cryptic teachings are, are given in, in the Gospel of John in the very place in Jerusalem where people are more likely to understand what he's getting at. Uh, uh, these uh, the, the, and, and these more cryptic sayings are also what people would be least likely to remember who didn't understand it. But it seems that that John is is tuned into that uh, to that frequency. Um, Jesus um, uh, Jesus said a lot of things in his three years of, of public ministry, and his manner of expressing himself, as well as what was remembered by his audiences, uh, no doubt varied. In uh, Jesus, uh, um, or, or the Gospel of John, the author of God, the Gospel of John, who, whom I would take to be the John the Evangelist, seems to have been especially, especially in tune with some of uh, Jesus' uh, deepest spiritual teaching. And he's, he's not trying to just simply duplicate what the other evangelists have said. Um, and so it's small wonder then that we have rather different material there. Um, also recall from cognitive psychology that we're not generally very good at remembering what we've experienced when it doesn't make sense to us. It's the flip side of the frequency illusion. So I, I learn a new vocabulary word, and then four times in the next week, I might encounter it in my reading. And well, is, 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 you might ask, well, is, is the universe playing a benign trick on me? Well, no, the word was doubtless and other things I've been reading all along, but I passed over it without noticing it. But um, um, so, so John, who paid special attention to what must have been some of Jesus' stranger, more cryptic utterances, is the one who recalls them and puts them at the heart of his gospel. So. Um, Where's the mystery in that? Um, furthermore, um, uh, we we also uh, we have I think parallels between the these the these these statements that we find in John that seem to be uh, unique to John and the Synoptic Gospels. Um, of course, uh, the the argument is that um, in in John um, we have all these these emphatic statements or claims to deity. We have the I am statements. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. Um, I, um, I am the light of the world, I am the good shepherd, and so forth. And, and we don't have that in the synoptics, or so the argument goes. Um, and furthermore, uh, Jesus in the synoptics, we, we have this so-called messianic secret, where Jesus is constantly telling people not to tell that he's the Messiah. And yet in the Gospel of John, all he does, it seems, is tell people what, who he is, right? And so how do we make sense of that? Uh, well, notice that it's, it's not quite the same claim to, uh, to be the Messiah as it is to, to claim deity. Uh, and in the, the, the messianic secret is Jesus not wanting it publicly known uh, uh, to, to early that, that he is the Messiah because of the Jewish expectation at that time of a Messiah who would uh, uh, um, overthrow the, the Roman occupiers and reestablish a Davidic reign and restore Israel to its rightful place and so forth. And there were people who threatened to make Jesus king by force. You even see that in the Gospel of John uh, in chapter 6. That's why Jesus tries to avoid um, the crowds. And, uh, and, and also, it's, what's interesting is that in, in the Gospel of John, chapter 4, Jesus does disclose his messianic identity. He does tell someone who's not among the, the 12 inner circle that he is the Messiah. But notice who that individual is. It's a, it's a Samaritan. It's a Samaritan lady at the well. Um, and uh, and why, why would Jesus disclose his messianic identity to her, um, even though he didn't disclose it to anyone else, according to the Gospels, outside of his inner circle? Well, and the Samaritans had a different understanding of what it meant to be the Messiah because the Samaritans only recognized the five books of Moses. And so they had this more prophetic, uh, this understanding of the, of the Messianic identity that was more of a prophet. Um, and so that's why um, the, the woman in John chapter 4 speaks about the prophet that's to come. And of course, that, that comes from Deuteronomy 18. So that's how I'd make sense of the, the so-called Messianic secret and the fact that Jesus um, and, and how that relates to, uh, to the Gospel of John. Now, what about some of the, the um, precedents for, for the statements that Jesus makes in, in the Gospel of John in the Synoptics? Well, you, you already alluded to the, the so-called Johannine Thunderbolts, and, and uh, we find this in Matthew chapter 11, which, which seems to parallel the sort of way that Jesus speaks according to the Gospel of John, even though this is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, so Jesus says from verse 25 through 29, in, in Matthew chapter 11, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. 
Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for, my, for, my, I, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that, uh, that is something that, uh, that's, a, that's a passage that would seem to be set very well at home in, uh, in the Gospel of, of John. Compare it, for example, with John 14, 6, where Jesus says, um, um, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You've got um, parallels um, there um, in, in the Gospel of John. What about the I am statements in John, though? So Jesus says in John eight twelve, for example, I am the light of the world. But uh, if you look at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew ch- uh, in Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, says to his disciples, you are the light of the world. So if he's prepared to accept that his disciples are the light of the world, then he may well also be prepared to accept that he is the light of the world. So there's not really a, a problem there, I think. Um, and John chapter 10, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. But you see this imagery of Jesus being the good shepherd in the Synoptic Gospels as well. For example, in Matthew chapter 18, verse 12, what do you think if a man has has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the 99 on the mountains and go in search of the one that went astray? Or Matthew 26, 31, Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Um, another example is uh, in John 6, 35, where Jesus says, to, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Again, we find a precedent for this in the Synoptic Gospels. Mark 14, verse 22, when Jesus is at the Last Supper with the disciples, it says, as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Uh, and so we, we, we see um, precedents uh, among, among the Synoptic Gospels for really all of, all, all of the I Am statements. Um, and so I think actually... Um, and the, um, I, I don't think it's, it's such a, a difficult problem as it first appears that Jesus appears to, to speak rather differently uh, in, in the Gospel of John relative to the synoptics. Yes, no, I, I think you brilliantly illustrate that Jesus' use of the shepherd imagery is consistent throughout all four Gospels. And therefore, it, I think it's pretty undeniable to say that Jesus referred to himself as the shepherd, which, of course, according to the book of Zechariah, all throughout uh, you know, Ezekiel chapters four and five about the sort of the, the shepherd coming seems very much to be a title of Yahweh in, in light of, for example, uh, Yahweh shepherding Israel through the Exodus wanderings. Now, one aspect too which comes to mind is often people will ask us, particularly if we're debating uh, someone who is a Muslim or an atheist or an agnostic, or even just a, a curious agnostic, you know, where does Jesus claim to be deity? Now, you and I obviously know that there are many more passages than John 14 and John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am, or I am the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and that there are plenty of places where this divine claim is made in the synoptics. But of course, many of our skeptics, many of our primary opponents, the Bart Ehrmans of the world, and, and many others, unfortunately, it seems as though even in some conservative evangelical circles, will try to say that uh, Jesus did not make as many explicit claims. Now, one explicit claim that comes to mind, and definitely correct me uh, if you think I'm wrong, uh, Professor McLaughlin, is particularly in all four Gospels, but particularly in Mark chapter 2, we have a cluster of events where Jesus seems to be attributing Yahwehistic titles to himself. For example, uh, he claims to be the son of man who uniquely is able to forgive sins when he heals the paralytic. And this is in an episode where he refers to the paralytic as son, in, at least in this uh, understanding of the event, but putting, in, putting him in a position of authority. Uh, what's also too interesting for me is he then later on claims to be the bridegroom, uh, something that John the Baptist also claims about Jesus Christ in the Gospel of John. Um, and we see all throughout the book of Hosea, the bridegroom being a descriptive term to point to Yahweh in relationship to faithless Israel at that time because of idolatry. And then, of course, it all seems to culminate in Jesus' claim to be the Lord of the Sabbath. And in the Matthew version, which is really interesting to me, he says that one greater than the temple is standing here. Well, the temple is where the real presence of God actually resides. So if he's claiming to be greater than the temple. He's claiming 
to first be the presence of God on earth, imminently present, but then to be the Lord of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is outlined in the Ten Commandments. He's essentially claiming to be the Lord of the Commandments. Do you think that that cluster in Mark 2 and its presentation in Matthew and Luke uh, constitute divine claims on equal par with John chapter 8? And do you think that this is an accurate historical reference to point to Jesus's self-identification with the God of the Old Testament? I agree with you on most of these instances. With um, So I, I, the one I would probably most be skeptical of is uh, the Lord of the Sabbath reference, um, because I think contextually he's not actually claiming himself to be Lord of the Sabbath there, but is claiming that humans are Lord of the Sabbath. If you read the context, he says, um, so it says on Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain, and the Pharisees were, were saying to him, Luke, um, <clears throat> Luke, why are you, they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath, so that the Lord, Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And I think it's plausible to understand contextually the title Son of Man here, not to refer to the Danielic Son of Man, although there are other references to that in, in the Gospels. Uh, but rather, Son of Man is used sometimes as, as simply an idiomatic expression for a human being. You see it used that way, for example, in Psalm 8 uh, and various other passages in the Old Testament. Um, so I think it's plausible to understand the Son of Man there as a reference to human beings being master of the Sabbath. Uh, um, Kyrios, of course, can mean, can mean master um, as well as Lord. Um, so that that, um, that one, I think, is probably the weakest of the ones in Mark uh, chapter 2. The the one about uh, forgiving sins in uh, at the beginning of uh, Mark chapter 2, I think, uh, is is a good one, although I don't think it's the strongest example. Um, I think it's, uh, it's quite suggestive, though. Um, obviously, the response that you typically get to that from people who are uh, biblical Unitarians and Muslims and, and, uh, and Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth is that he forgives by, by the permission of... Um, of God, or he gives, he forgives on behalf of of God. Um, the response that people who would use this text to support uh, the deity of Christ would respond, would, they, they would respond to that by saying that uh, that Jesus seems to be claiming that he himself has authority uh, on earth to forgive sins. He's not simply announcing forgiveness on behalf of God, but is actually claiming authority on earth to forgive sins. And, and it's interesting that uh, this um, points back also to the Old Testament where we see the, the angel of the Lord in, um, in Exodus 23, 20 and 21. Who, and God says that, um, do not rebel against him, for he will not pardon your transgression, for my name is in him. In other words, he has the a prerogative and authority to forgive sins and with, to withhold forgiveness because God's name dwells in him. You also see that in Zechariah 3, where the angel of the Lord removes the filthy garments from Joshua, the high priest who represents the nation of Israel, and clothes them with pure vestments of the high priest. And he's and then he claims credit for forgiving sins. He says, I have taken your iniquity away from you. I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I think the Old Testament, as well as the New, presents Jesus as the Malach Yahweh, the angel of the Lord. And um, so there's that, that's an interesting connection as well. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with you on on the bridegroom. Um, I think that that um, also points to the, the, the deity of Christ. Um, some more examples, though, um, which I think are um, even stronger. Um, let, let's take, for instance, um, let, let me just take one passage from the synoptics and show numerous. Um, actually, let me give you two passages from the synoptics, which I think are really um, compelling. Um, here's one from Matthew chapter 11. Um, but here's it's a, um, it, verse from verse two. It says, when John Herod in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who's not offended by me. And uh, Isaiah so, 35. Yeah, exactly. He's quoting from Isaiah 35. So John the Baptist sends disciples to Jesus to ask him, are you the one we're expecting or should we wait for another? And Jesus says, go back to John 10, we've seen here, and he lays out the evidences because Jesus was a good evidentialist, of course. And uh, he's, he's um, alluding to or quoting from 
as either day five, which talk about the signs that you expect to see when Yahweh shows up to save his people. Now, if you're a Unitarian, you might respond to this and say, well, um, yeah, Yahweh is showing up to save his people, and therefore it's appropriate for Jesus to quote Isaiah 35, but, he, but Yahweh is doing so through the person of Jesus. And so that's probably how I'd respond if I was a Unitarian. However, what beca- where it becomes much more convincing is, when, is what happens next. So if you look at verse 7, it says, As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. So that he's going from Malachi 3, verse 1, right? Truly yes. I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the promise and the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so he identifies John the Baptist as the um, the forerunner prophesied in the, uh, in the book of, of Malachi, the one who was said to you know, be Elijah um, in, 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 in the book of Malachi. So he's, he's quoting from Malachi 3 verse 1, and, he, and Malachi 3 verse 1, which parallels Isaiah 40 verse 3 as well, which is um, which is alluded to in, in Mark chapter 1, as well as you know in verse 2 and 3. Isaiah 40 verse 3 and Malachi 3 verse 1 both speak of uh, uh, Yahweh, uh, Yahweh, uh, Yahweh's way being prepared for by a forerunner. The way is prepared and Yahweh comes down it. And yet according to Jesus in Matthew 11, the way is prepared and who comes down it? Jesus himself. Um, so, and the fact that the fact that the way is being prepared for Jesus, I think, is clear because notice the context in which Jesus alludes to Malachi 3, verse 1. He's, uh, he's just been approached by disciples from John the Baptist saying, are you the one we were expecting? In other words, are you the one that I've been preparing the way for all this time? Right? And Jesus says, yes. And then he um, proceeds to quote from, from Malachi 3, verse 1. And the, the Hebrew expression that's used in Malachi 3, 1 is ha adon, that's used of Yahweh, which is a title only ever used of Yahweh. And so that, I think, points very powerfully towards the deity of Christ. I'll give you another example. Here's, um, here's Matthew chapter 21. There's a whole cluster of, of, past, of um, references here to the Old Testament in Matthew chapter 21, which I think point powerfully to the deity of Christ. Um, this, is, this is the narrative concerning the triumphal entry, which is actually reported in all four Gospels, although Matthew contains the most Old Testament allusions of any of the four Gospels. And so that's why I use Matthew here. Um, so um, it says, When they drew near to Jerusalem and Beth, came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you fi- will find a, a donkey tied and a colt with her, untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt the full of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and they sat on them. Um, and by the way, um, just as an aside, Bar Ehrman, uh, in his book, uh, um, Jesus Interrupted, Point, um, he argues that actually Matthew has Jesus riding two animals simultaneously. And I'm sure you've heard this argument. Um, yeah. but it's, it's a really bad argument because I think the nearest antecedent to the, to, the, um, to the pronoun, when he says he sat on them, the nearest antecedent is cloaks. He sat on the cloaks. It's not that he's rad, rad, he rode the two animals simultaneously. Um, but that's just as, as an aside. So what's the passage that he's alluding to in in this first part of, of Matthew 21. Well, he's alluding to Zechariah 9, is he not? Uh, Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9, um, where we read about uh, Israel's king coming, uh, bringing salvation, riding on the back of a donkey. Um, now, if we go over to Zechariah chapter 9, we read the context here. It says, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow shall be cut off and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Return to your stronghold, O prisoners of hope. Today I declare that I will restore to you double. Okay? Now, um, what's interesting is that, um, is that 
uh, we see the striking parallels between this passage in Zechariah 9, 9 through 12, and the passages in Isaiah to do with the suffering servant, right? You see that the suffering yeah. servant's mission was to, uh, um, to bring world peace, establish worldwide dominion and global justice, and uh, he was to rule from sea to sea and shore to shore and so forth. And uh, the nations were to lay down their arms, uh, ultimately, uh, in response to the Messiah, and uh, the and they beat their plows into, into stores into plowshares and Isaiah 2 and, and so forth. So um, this is dealing with the same messianic figure that we see in the book of Isaiah. And, and of course, in the book of Isaiah, incidentally, the, uh, the, the, the child that's born, uh, that's the Messiah in Isaiah 9, 6, is identified as by, by multiple titles that point to his deity, such as might, a mighty God, El Gabor, a title used of Yahweh in Isaiah 10, 21. He's called Wonderful Counselor, which is a title used of Yahweh, I think, at the end of Isaiah 28. Um, there's the, um, he's called the, the Father of Eternity. So the, the child figure in Isaiah is, is himself Yahweh. Furthermore, if you go over to the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, we have a parallel passage where, this is from verse 14, um, notice the parallel between this passage and what we have in Zechariah 9, 9 through 12. This is Zechariah 3, ver from verse 14 and following. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. So you, you notice the parallels already. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. And then we get to verse 15. It says, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. Um, and so he's bringing salvation again. So the context is similar. And um, the, the Messiah comes to bring salvation. And then verse 15 continues. The king of Israel. So again, we have a king of Israel, just as we did in Zechariah 9. But who is it? The king of Israel, Yahweh, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. And that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time, I will deal with all your oppressors and I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you in at the time when I gather you together for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth, when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. And of course, that also parallels Zechariah 9, because um, in Zechariah 9, um, verse 12, we read that God would restore the fortunes of Israel. He would restore to them double. Um, so again, we see these, these parallels between Zechariah 9 and Zechariah, Zephaniah 3, except the king of Israel in Zephaniah 3 is Yahweh. And so that su suggests that the king, in, the king of Israel in Zechariah 9 also is Yahweh. Furthermore, uh, it gets even better. If we go over to um, Zechariah 14, we, we read about when the, the coming day of the Lord, when the Lord would um, defend Israel against her, neighbor, against her enemies who were encamped against her. And it says, Behold, a day is coming for the Lord, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half the city shall go out into exile, but the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. Wait, Yahweh has physical feet. And uh, what's interesting is that um, it says his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. So Yahweh has physical feet that stand literally on the Mount of Olives. How do we know it's literal and physical? Because it goes on, the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley so that one half the mountain shall move northward and the other half southward. So there's a physical effect on the mountain by Yahweh's physical feet touching the Mount of Olives. And furthermore, notice um, this is actually alluded to in Acts chapter 1, where, um, where the disciples see Jesus ascend into heaven from the Mount of Olives, and they're told this by the angels, this Jesus, whom you saw go up into heaven, will return the same way you saw him go. In other words, his feet will once again stand in the Mount of Olives. I, I, I would argue a, an illusion, a deliberate illusion to Zechariah 14, which also in, there you have in the Book of Acts, again, an affirmation of Christ's deity by this illusion to Zechariah 14, which most people miss. Um, so it, goes, it continues in Zechariah 14, verse 5, you shall flee from the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azul, and you shall flee as you have fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come and all the holy ones with him, which is, of course, alluded to um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
where it speaks about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And then verse 6 continues, um, On that day there shall be no light, cold, or frost, and there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord neither day nor night. But at evening time there shall be light. On that day living waters shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter. And then verse 9 is the kicker. Verse 9, And Yahweh will be king over all the earth. On that day Yahweh will be one and his name one. But I thought we just read in Zechariah 9 that the Messianic king gets to be king over all the earth. Well, which is it? Is it the Messianic king or is it Yahweh? Well, it's both because the Messianic king is Yahweh himself. Um, and so a, a biblical Unitarian or a Muslim will respond to that typically and say, well, he's, uh, the, the, um, you, you, this is just using the, the language of agency or the law of agency that the, 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 um, the, the, mess, the Messiah is, is the king through which Yahweh operates. So yes, Yahweh is king, but he works through, uh, he, he, he works through uh, the Messiah. Um, so that's how they would understand that. The problem is that uh, in we, we we have the language of Yahweh having physical feet in in uh, in, Zechari in Zechariah 14, that Yahweh Himself comes, um, His feet stand on the Mount of Olives. So it's Yahweh Himself that rules from Jerusalem. So that why would He Himself come and also be using an agent? Uh, it doesn't make um, much sense to me. So there, so there, just with the triumphal entry, you have an affirmation of the deity of Christ, which is something reported in all four Gospels, incidentally. Furthermore, um, we continue reading in Matthew chapter 21. So he just quoted, he just got done quoting Zechariah 9. Um, and it says, um, and then he sits on the cloaks on the donkey. And verse 8, most of the crowds spread their cloaks in the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Now, what's that alluding to? That's an allusion to Psalm 118. In Psalm 118, it says, uh, um, verse 25, Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Um, and actually, it uses uh, the term Hosanna there, and that's what the, um, that's, uh, what the um, people in Jerusalem are, are, are quoting from. And verse 26 continues. So verse 25 says, um, Save us, we pray, O Lord, O Lord, we pray, give us success. Verse 26, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Um, so Jesus so, the, so the, um, Jesus is being, um, or the, the Jews um, in Jerusalem are, are crying out, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Ascribing those Hosannas to Jesus, right? Where, yes. Whereas in Psalm 118, they're ascribed to Yahweh. And then it continues. Verse 10 of Matthew 21. Matthew 21, verse 10. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was seared up, saying, Who is this? Uh, which I think is a possible and quite plausible allusion to Psalm 24. Remember, who is this king of glory? When you have yes. um, the Lord of glory coming to the gates. And who is this Lord? Who yes. is this king of glory? So um, they said, Who is this? Um, especially in the context of uh, Zechariah 9 being quoted, which is about the king of Israel approaching. And in verse 11 says, the crowd said, this is the prophet, Jesus, from Nazareth of Galilee. And then it continues. Um, so um, you've got verse 12 and 13, uh, where Jesus enters. You've got the cleansing of the temple. And Jesus says, my house should be called a house of prayer. But you make it a den of robbers. And then, um, uh, and then verse 14 says, the blind, the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are, these are saying? And Jesus said, so in other words, they understand exactly what the implications are, right? And then it says, and Jesus said to them, yes, have you never read? And then he quotes from Psalm 8, out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. Now what's Psalm 8 about? Well, in Psalm 8, it says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. So in Psalm 8, it's Yahweh uh, that, the people are, that the people are praising. It's Yahweh that, that, uh, that is, is praised by the mouths of infants and nursing babies. But Jesus is taking that passage from Psalm 8 and applying it to himself. Um, and then it says that he, leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. And then finally, in verse 18, it says, In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, may no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. That's also alluding to the Old Testament. Look at uh, Jeremiah 8, verse 13, where it says, when I would gather them, 
that spe- me, speaking about the people of Israel, declares the Lord, there are no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree, even the leaves are withered, and what I gave them has passed away from them. So, G- so there we have this image where Yahweh is inspecting the nation of Israel for figs and finds no figs, but only leaves. And, and so in, in Matthew 21, it's Jesus who inspects the, the fig tree for, for figs, but finds no figs, but only leaves. And of course, the, the fig tree represents the nation of Israel. And because it's bearing leaves out of season, it represents this hypocrisy, the hypocrisy of the nation. So you see how saturated the Gospels are with this Old Testament imagery that we often overlook because so many people are unfamiliar with the Old Testament. But if you study the, the Old Testament allusions and imagery carefully, it points very powerfully and cumulatively to the deity of Christ. Yes, absolutely. You know, one of the areas though which becomes quite thorny for me is, um, and often in my own debates, often language of position will be mistaken for language of ontology. Mm-hmm. So, for example, you have um, Peter's speech at Pentecost, where he clearly, I think he beautifully outlines the deity of Jesus. He explains quite clearly that, you know, this is literally the name of the Lord. Jesus is, ontologically speaking, the name hypostasis, similar to the word. But then he'll go on later to say, but God hath made this Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now, I would say that term made is positional, similar to the term uh, firstborn in Colossians chapter one. It doesn't mean that Jesus was literally created. It means that he was placed before the foundations of the world, the term appointed is often used as well, uh, in order to have the role of preeminence. And I think that the Jewish audience there on the ground probably got that. But unfortunately, a lot of that language is ripped out of its first century Jewish context and often used as sort of a cudgel. Uh, Similarly, another argument that is often foisted uh, is in that passage, I think, at the Areopagus with um, the, the position in Acts, where you have Paul saying that God has appointed this man to be judge of all the earth. Now, I think you and I would both know Essentially, Paul is the preeminent defender of the, G- uh, the divinity of Jesus. I mean, you have not only Colossians, but you have Philippians too. So I've always taken that to mean, essentially, clearly the, uh, the prerogative of judgment, which you see in Matthew chapter 24, and you see in the trial of Jesus, when they ask, are you the son of the most high, the son of the blessed? In Mark 14, Jesus says, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power coming in the clouds of glory. Well, coming in the clouds, as we both know, is a Yahwehistic prerogative that you see, uh, also shared by the Son of Man figure in Daniel 7. And you also see uh, him seated at the right hand, which seems to be a Semitic position of equality, at least equality of positional power. So the thing about it is, how would you help uh, illuminate, for example, those, those statements? And how would you best uh, try to uh, escape sort of the language of position in order to point to Jesus's clear presentation? And particularly the position in uh, Luke's writings, where he often emphasizes the humanity of our Lord, um, these specific references to the divinity of Jesus in keeping in perfect continuity with John. Sure. So um, there's a lot of passages that one could look at. Is there any particular one you want me to go to first? or? No, I mean, I definitely, definitely take it away. My, my only question is, how would you, would you say that the language position is right in my interpretation of those two uh, passages in Acts? Uh, you mean uh, the passage in Acts 2 and Acts 17, right? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Yeah. So in Acts chapter 2, uh, it says, um, so... Um, so this is at, at Pentecost, where, Jesus, where Peter gives his uh, speech, and he quotes from the book of Joel. And he says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, I will pour out my f- spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, uh, et, et cetera. Um, and notice, um, first of all, that... It's, it's Yahweh who's pouring out his spirit on all flesh, right? So it's Yahweh who's doing the pouring. However, if you continue reading in Acts at chapter 2, we learn that actually the one who does the pouring is, is Christ. Um, so if you look at verse um, 33 of Acts 2, it says, Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he is... He, Christ has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So who's doing the pouring? 
it's Yahweh, according to Peter, but Peter also says it's Christ who's, who's responsible for doing the pouring. Um, furthermore, as you mentioned, in verse 21, it says, it shall come to pass, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, uh, whose name are we to call on, according to Peter and according to Joel, the prophet? Well, it's Yahweh's name. Everyone who calls upon the name of Yahweh shall be saved. But as you, as you rightly said, um, Peter also, um, calls them in, in verse 38 to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And as you're also aware, in, in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, what does he say? He says, he says there was salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Um, and so whose name are we to call on? Well, Yahweh, but according to, to Peter, is, is the name of Jesus is, is basically synonymous with, with that of Yahweh. Now, this passage is also um, quoted um, in, in, the, in the Pauline uh, epistles. Uh, for example, in Romans 10, um, in, in verse 9, it says, this is a very famous uh, memory verse, um, because if you confess with your mouth, mouth that jesus is lord and believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved okay and then later in that same passage he says uh, he he again quotes from from jewel uh, saying verse 13 um well verse 12 and 13 says for there is no distinction between jew and greek for the same lord is lord of all bestowing his riches and all who call on him for everyone who calls on the name of the lord will be saved well we just learned that the Lord is Jesus. If you confess with the man Jesus as Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And yet we're to call upon Jesus in order to be saved according to Romans, according to Romans um, chapter 10. And according to the context of Joel that he's quoting from is actually Yahweh whom we're to call upon. Um, furthermore, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we also have um, an allusion to uh, this passage. It says, um, verse 2, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. So again, the name, the, the Lord that we're to call upon, according to Paul, is Jesus. But according to Joel that he's alluding to, it's Yahweh. So it seems to me to be quite clear that the, the, the Lord of Joel 2 is, is in fact Jesus. Um, so uh, that's what I'd say on, on that passage. Um, does that satisfy you? Or? Oh, no, I don't think so. so this is basically my, my own defense of the passage. Because often that term made gets um, often wielded against me in, in, in debates. And I, and I often have to point to, no, that this language of God making Jesus Lord is actually a language like to the term appointed in the book of Hebrews, where it's in eternity. Um, the father uh, has placed the son in the position of preeminence rather than essentially it happening at some point in time. Because it, it seems to me that if one was to take that term made in an ontological sense, it would be inconsistent with all the other passages. Yeah, um, you're, you're right. And, and one thing I also want to say on Acts 2 is that it's, it's, Acts 2 is profoundly Trinitarian. I've already shown the deity of yeah. Christ. It also points to the deity of the Holy Spirit and also the personal distinctiveness of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is poured out by Yahweh and by Jesus, right? And so the Holy Spirit is a separate entity. We learn elsewhere in the book of Acts that the Spirit is also a personal agency. For example, in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira are said to have lied to the Holy Spirit. And you don't lie to in personal force. And in Acts 13, the Holy Spirit says, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, to the work that I've called them in, in Acts in a very personal way, uh, and so forth. And, and also in Acts 15, where at the Jerusalem Council, they say it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit. Um, and so the Holy Spirit seems to be um, a personal agency. And there's many other passages throughout the Big of Acts and also the New Testament more, more broadly, as well as the Old Testament, which point to the, the personality of the Holy Spirit. And notice also in Acts chapter 2, verse 18, it says, um, so sorry, in Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, it says that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh, right? So that implies the omnipresence of the Holy Spirit, which is a prerogative and attribute only of deity. Uh, and so again, points to the deity of the Holy Spirit. So there in Acts 2, you already got the Trinity. Um, and I, I already showed you earlier that Acts chapter 1 also points to the deity of Christ because you have Jesus ascending from the Mount of Olives and the, the angels tell the disciples this Jesus, whom you still go up into heaven, will ascend, will, will come back the same way you saw him go up into heaven. Uh, and in, as I, as alluding to Zechariah 14, where Yahweh comes 
to deliver his people and his feet, physical feet, stand on the Mount of Olives. And I think that's the, the illusion in view there. So I think you've got good evidence there too. Um, on Acts 17, um, and uh, Paul's statement that God has made, um, has made him uh, both Lord and Christ. Um, uh, I think Paul says that he has appointed this man to be judge. All right, yeah, you're right. So, so Peter says this, Jesus, whom he crucified, God has, has appointed both Lord and Christ. Um, and uh, Acts 17, God has um, um, said at the day when he will judge the world by the man he's appointed. He has given proof of this to all men by raising him from the dead. Um, and yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would agree. I would say that the, the, uh, the, Yahweh, the, the, son, the son of man figure or the messianic figure, um, even, even if you read the Old Testament, we learn that the son of man or the Messiah is, is given authority, glory, and sovereign power by the ancient of days. Um, and all peoples, nations, and many of every language worship him. Uh, I, so I, I would argue that there, there is a sense in which the, the Son or the Messiah is functionally subordinate to the Father and receives certain things from the Father. Um, we're, we're, um, we're not Unitarians, we're Trinitarians, so we think that the Father can give certain things and privileges to the, to the Son. And uh, I, I would argue that he, when, when in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 11, um, um, when it says that... Uh, um, and uh, it says, have, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not call equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed in him the name that's above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Um, I would argue that uh, the, the name that he's received that's, that's higher than every other, and that's, by the way, an allusion to Isaiah 45, 23, where it's Yahweh, yeah. every knee shall bow and tongue confess and swear allegiance, um, et cetera. Um, yeah. Exactly. Um, and I would argue that the name that he receives that's greater than all um, is, is his, it refers to his reputation, if you will, um, the, the, and uh, his reputation for, for what he's accomplished. And, uh, and he receives, when he ascends into glory again, at the ascension, he receives back all of the privileges that he enjoyed prior to the incarnation. Uh, we see that um, in John 17, five, for example, where he says, now father glorify me with the glory I shared at your side before the world was created. Um, and uh, I don't have a problem with saying that he was made Christ or appointed Christ because the, because, uh, the son wasn't always Jesus. I mean, the, the son is eternal, but the, the man Jesus is not eternal, right? The, um, the, the, uh, he hasn't existed eternally incarnate in human flesh. Um, and the Messiah, he, he didn't bear the title of Messiah until the incarnation, I think. So I, I wouldn't necessarily have a, have a problem with these passages. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it ultimately is, as long as we recognize that from eternity, the eternal son, you know, begotten, not made consubstantial of the Father, through whom all things were made, was essentially uh, appointed in eternity, then I, then I think we're solid. The instant we want to say that, you know, the Father gave Jesus his position as Christ in time, I think it becomes a very tricky, um, tricky, slippery slope. And, and I think that's, that's where the position language of being made, appointed, and given I think only makes sense in a first century Jewish context. Because similar with the term firstborn, where you and I both know the term firstborn in Exodus, what is it, chapter five, six, basically refers to Israel. Although we both know Jacob is the younger son of Isaac, definitely not the firstborn, is a positional term. So when we see that in Colossians, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You know, we, we both know that essentially that's not referring to ontology and later on, by the statement, he was before all things, it definitely places Jesus as an eternal person. Of course, right. as you said, you know, his divine nature being eternal, him assuming a human nature at the point of his, um, you know, of course, the, the incarnation, the, uh, the conception of Jesus through the virgin birth. Now, my other question too is, so often I can imagine if I'm sitting down with Craig Evans or Dr. Michael Lacona, and I was about to debate them on all of these points in light of the Gospel of John. What they will probably claim is they will try and claim that they that John has sock puppeted Jesus to use, I think, Dr. Lydia McGrew's term on one of her blogs, if, if my memory is working correctly, that John is simply putting words 
in Jesus' mouth in order to focus on his divinity and his pre-existence. Now, I, I would challenge that on three fronts, and definitely let me know if you think I'm dead on right here. First, John is writing, I think, circa 90 AD, circa 95 in Ephesus, according to the patristic evidence. Although I think some written material easily could have existed prior to that. The way I look at it is you have enough eyewitnesses, maybe not of the 12, it seems like they have passed along except for John, but certainly members of the 70 could have been still around. So you still have eyewitnesses who would have said, no, John, what are you doing? He didn't say that. But you see no contestation of the Johannine statements at all. My second point of argument, and let me know if you think I'm onto something here, is that language of pre-existence, while it does primarily show up in John, isn't exclusive to John. Um, I think in Acts, I forget whether, not Acts, sorry, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, I think 15, there is that parallelism between the man of dust and the man from heaven. Well, the term from is a genitive of source. So essentially in that passage, Paul is saying Jesus is liter literally from heaven. Therefore, that's a reference to preexistence before 70 AD, along with, of course, you know, all the creedal statements that you and I both can point to along with the book of Hebrews. The other point is, and let me know if this is too cryptic of a reference, do you think, for the preexistence in the synoptics. You have Jesus stating in uh, Mark chapter 2 and all throughout the parallel passages about the healing of the paralytic that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Well, we have later on the, the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven, suggesting that if the Son of Man has to be highlighted for having authority on earth, that seems to imply that he has some position already uh, in pre-existence in heaven. Uh, and my other point of passage would be Jesus' statement. I think it's earlier on in uh, Mark, but it's also in Matthew and Luke, where essentially the disciples try to find Jesus in Capernaum. He has left the, the main city center. And I think Peter asks, you know, they're all looking for you. And he says, we must go into the other villages for this cause I have come forth. Well, the term come forth, well, it can mean come forth from Capernaum, come forth from Nazareth. It's still, I think, in light of the language of preexistence throughout the whole New Testament, seems to have that ring of preexistence, even if it doesn't explicitly say so. It seems to have sharp, implicit features. Do you think that three-part argument actually holds up? Um, and how would you improve it if um, if you think it has some points of weakness. Yeah, it's a great point. And uh, first off, I'll just mention also uh, in regards to the title of firstborn, that's also a title that's used in Psalm 89, 27, as well of David saying, saying, speaking of David, I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And so there's again, you see that, that title of firstborn used in a non-ontological sense. Um, in regards to uh, pre-existence, um, I'm sure you're, um, you're, you also uh, like to use the argument from uh, Matthew 23, 37, where Jesus is uh, lamenting over Jerusalem, saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing? That also seems to suggest uh, pre-existence of the sun. I mean, there's two possible interpretations of that. One is that it's, uh, it's alluding to the pre-existence of the sun, or another is that it's alluding to the earlier um, uh, Judean part of Jesus' ministry as reported in, in the Gospel of John. I, I think, I personally think that the, the former view, that is that it's alluding to the pre-existence of the Son is more, is more plausible. Um, and I agree with your um, exegesis of the other passages. You mentioned, um, 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 what, uh, um, what were the specific passages you mentioned again? Is, yeah, so I, I know one is found in Mark too, which is, you know, the Son of Man has authority on earth. To yeah, yeah. Is, suggesting yeah, the, on, uh, yeah. Uh, of, the, of the examples you gave, that was probably the weakest one, or the one I was least convinced of, um, because you, uh, there, there, there at least seemed to be plausible ways that a Unitarian could interpret that. Um, what were the other ones you mentioned again? And, and the, the other one was, of course, um, Jesus' statement. I forget where it is um, in the synoptics. It's very early on. It's in Jesus' Capernaum ministry where he leaves alone to pray. The disciples come. Peter asks, you know, where are you? We've been looking for you. And Jesus says, uh, we must preach in the other villages for this cause I have come forth. Now, 
naturally, like you said, I'm sure they're Unitarian, a Muslim, an atheist, an agnostic. You look at that passage and say, well, he's come forth from Nazareth. He's come forth from, um, you know, Bethlehem. But it just seems to anchor both those passages, which I think even um, a Bart Ehrman would have to assume is, is historical, uh, in light of, I think, some passage in First Corinthians, where there's a parallelism between the man from dust, Adam, and then the man from heaven, Jesus, um, seems to at least hint at pre-existence, if, even if it doesn't explicitly say uh, precisely what we see in Before Abraham Was I Am, in like a John chapter 8. Um. Yeah, I'm, I'm not so convinced by the one in Mark 1, uh, 38, where it, sa- he's, um, it, sa- it says, uh, so from verse 35, it says, Rising very early in the morning, then while it was still dark, he departed and went out to a desolate place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him, and they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. And he said to them, Let us go on the road to the next towns. I may preach there also, for that is why I came out. And the Greek term that's used there is um, um, exelthon, which literally um, um, is is, 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 he's he's literally saying um, that that's why he 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 went out. Um, So uh, I, I I would I would tend to understand that as that's why he. Uh, he that's why he came out to this place rather than making a, a statement about coming to earth from heaven um, i think i'd lean towards that, that interpretation more than the interpretation you suggested does that make sense no, no I, I definitely in the immediate context would definitely suit that my 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 only question then would be so where can we see examples of pre-existence and in the synoptics because clearly as you said that passage over jerusalem where Jesus says, I wish I would have gathered you under my wings like a hen. I mean, that reminds me very much of Psalm 91, where Yahweh is described as almost like a mother hen uh, guarding her chicks uh, under Yahweh's wings. So he's definitely using Yahwehistic language and definitely sending the prophets, definitely fits in with the language of wisdom, which seems to be a kind of hypostasis in at least second humble Judaism. But for example, you know, one of the, the points here, which I'm fascinated by is, you know, where is Jesus making those pre-existent claims? And then two, often a question I get asked in, you know, th- some debate circles is why would John then seem to overload Jesus's statements with uh, claims to pre-existence? Now, I, my refutation of that would fundamentally be that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I think, wrote a lot more than what has survived. And then I w- what I would argue as well is that many of these pre-existent statements from Jesus um, in the Gospel of John might have, been, might have been extant in some form before 70 AD. I mean, the, the final redaction could have occurred in, in the 90s, but I, I see no reason why those pre-existent claims couldn't have uh, been composed earlier. Because if Jesus had verbally claimed pre-existence, as Lacona and Evans <laughs> seem to suggest, I don't see... How you, could, how you could end up with Colossians chapter 1 or Philippians chapter 2 to arrive at merely the Sermon um, on the Mount Jesus and to say that's all we have in terms of as explicit as you get to arrive at Colossians 1 seems somewhat incredulous. It seems like you would need uh, many, many more cases of claims to preexistence and claims to deity. And we do seem to see that in the Gospel of John occurring throughout the earthly ministry of Jesus. Do you think that makes any sense? Yeah, um, we certainly have more allusions to the preexistence in John, such as um, John seventeen five, for example, where he says, "Now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I shared with you before the world was created." That seems to be to me to be clear. Um, there's also um, the the reference in um, Matthew twenty three thirty seven I mentioned, uh, which is which is also in Luke. Uh, you've also got. Um, uh, and that that is of course the, the reference where Jesus uh, says how long I've longed to gather you together as a hen gathers a chicks under her wings but you're not willing. There's also um, the reference to uh, where Jesus says he came down from heaven. Uh, let's see uh, find the reference here. Um, I think John six he says you know I'm the bread of life. That's no, come that, that's in John. Um, you can see where you know where I'm hinging there. It seems to me it's a claim that. What you have in John is simply fabrications, doesn't add up with 
you know, as McGrew beautifully points, John's constant claim to be a historical eyewitness. Yeah. You know, we know that this man's witness is true. And it also doesn't add up with the earlier creedal statements. I mean, if all I'm left with is the statements of Jesus in the synoptics, I'm, I think that it would have been very difficult to arrive at, at Colossians 1 and Philippians 2. I'm not saying that there aren't claims to divinity in this stuff. It's, of course there are, as, as we've been covering. But it, it seems to me as though it requires something like a before Abraham was, I am. And, and I would argue that there are you know, smoking guns, as I think you beautifully alluded to in the synoptics, to those same claims of preexistence. But that seems to be the point of John's gospel, is to literally fill the gaps that Matthew, Mark, and Luke didn't get to. Because Matthew was ultimately martyred. Luke, I, I'm not quite sure where the early evidence actually points to. John Mark certainly is martyred, presumably in Alexandria, after you know, fleeing from Rome after the martyrdom of Peter, as uh, Peter's scribe. Whereas John seems to have had a lot of time to mold this stuff over. Um, I mean, he, he dies presumably as a very old man, in his late 80s, early 90s. So that seems to give more time for reflection. Whereas if you're fleeing from the authorities and you're being hunted from village to village, might there not have been time to jot down everything that needed to be said? So, but the Holy Spirit left the best wine for last, as it were. Uh, that some of the the more crisper statements that you see in John. Do you think that yeah. that's like fair statement? Yeah, I mean the the fact that Jesus claims deity in the synoptic. Yeah, you're you're right. The the statements I came down from heaven are, are in John. Um, only uh there are um and the, the, certainly the most explicit and the most uh numerous um, examples of pre-existent claims in the gospels are, are in the gospel of john the synoptic gospels have i think plenty of claims to deity which would in turn be claims to pre-existence because you can't be god without pre-existing so i'd, I'd probably appeal uh, to those um texts and um, and then there's there's a few that that at least suggest uh, pre-existence like the ones that we've already discussed um so i i um so i so i think i i that doesn't really bother me too much especially in view of the numerous passages in the synoptics which point to christ's deity um definitely and, and you know ultimately we, we should expect more in jesus's ministry than is actually recorded actually in the new testament i mean if you see john ending his gospels there is more uh that could be said and if all of it were written you know it filled all the books of the entire world right like john chapter 21 my my question is then moving on to the gospel of john like i said you know often airmen will use that argument from silence about the i am statements mm -hmm. in terms of denying their historicity um lacona and evans crumble under that argument from silence mcgrew i think beautifully illustrates i think correctly illustrates the idea that there is a random, randomness of salience. Not everything that seems relevant to some eyewitnesses on the ground at the given time turn out to be uh, what is equally re relevant later on. So John has the benefit of time to mold this stuff over. And he also, too, as you said, seems to have been able to deal with the more cryptic statements of Jesus and seems to have gravitated towards those more uh, to deliberately fill in those gaps. The, the thing about it in my mind, which I'd, I'd just ask you, is how would you uh, respond to that Airman uh, Evans uh, Lacona argument from silence? For, for me, it seems to be a very faulty, poor argument from strictly historical grounds. But it does yeah. seem it does seem interesting from um, an eyewitness standpoint that Matthew, who certainly was there in the John Eight episode, I, I'm assuming he was there in the Temple Court, didn't gravitate towards that but instead seems to have gravitated toward uh, Jesus's baptismal passage in um, the Ascension, uh, chapter 28, baptize all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, whereas John didn't gravitate towards that. So it, it, is, it is interesting evidence of cross-pollination of high Christology, but a different way of expressing that high Christology. Which is, it, it's kind of puzzled me. I was like, why did the synoptics, Paul, and, uh, and sometimes Peter, think of that high Christology in that form and John mentally in, in his own very unique way gravitate towards the same exact same things but in a different form is it that uh, John just gravitated towards those different sayings of Jesus 
uh, in the same way that I would gravitate towards different teachings of Dr. Chuck Missler or other evangelical expositional commentators more uh, rather than others. Like, how would you navigate that field? Yeah, on uh, the argument from silence, I, I think that it's a, a weak argument. We've already shown that there are numerous instances in the Synoptic Gospels where Jesus claims deity, um, and we've also seen examples where there are uh, precedents for the I am statements in, in the Gospel of John. Um, so uh, in view of those precedents, I, I, I think that the argument from silence is, is rendered uh, quite weak. Uh, furthermore, there's uh, you, you probably read uh, Dr. Timothy McGrew's paper on the argument from silence, which yes. I think exposed some of the folly of that as an historical paradigm. Uh, it is really difficult to make a robust argument from silence, and, and it's it's fraught with uh, problems because we have so many counter examples of instances where we'd expect an author to include this or that, and and they don't, and yet we know the event happened. Um, for example, um, um, uh, Josephus and Philo uh, both pass over the expulsion of the Jews from Rome by Claudius in silence. That was mentioned by the second century Roman historian Suetonius, and with just one passing mention of the event in the first century source, which is in Acts 18, verse 2. Yet despite Josephus' silence on this, all historians acknowledge that the event took place. Um, and uh, indeed, the, the only first century source uh, for the um, siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in AD 70 is Josephus. Um, Right. Um, we have some second century sources. We have um, Tacitus yeah. writes in the early second and in his histories, and also uh, Cassius Dio mentions it. But in the first century, we only have uh, Josephus, uh, and you, you would expect there to be more sources with such a cataclysmic, cataclysmic you know, world-shattering event, uh, and yet we don't. Uh, and so uh, it, it seems to me to be quite precarious ground on which to build an argument at this argument from Tacitus, because there are so many numerous counter examples. Um, so, yeah, so that would be my response, that we have precedent for the I am statements in John. We have a high Christology in the synoptics, uh, including on the, the, the lips of Jesus himself. And the argument from silence is historically qu quite a weak argument. Um, um, does, that, does that answer your question? Definitely. And, 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 and that's exactly how I formulated in the past. And I'll often point to our examples in the life of you know, Julius Caesar, which are only included in some sources, like sources like Plutarch versus more contemporary sources, but we still rely on Plutarch. You know, John's gospel is written in, in, or at least finally redacted in like 80, 90. And it seems to me that if you have an eyewitness source composed only 60 years after the event, um, to start questioning its historic, historiographical detail when it gets the geography right, you know, you and I can mention the five porticos of John chapter five. The fact that it gets Gabbatha, the pavement of Pontius Pilate right, the fact that it gets that the well uh, by the Samaritan woman is actually deep, uh, which is pretty interesting. Uh, it, it gets all these small uh, granular details right. So then to see uh, Craig Evans call the Gospel of John a parable really bothered me because parables don't have accurate geography. A sower went out to sow doesn't have names like Malchus, the ear of um, the of uh, the servant of Caiaphas, uh, which was cut off by Peter in uh, John chapter 18. And it's, it's interesting to me that, for example, episodes like the raising of Lazarus, I think Richard Bachan has raised a beautiful argument to suggest we could see why Lazarus might not have been mentioned earlier, because he was hunted down. People wanted to kill this man. So it's only after Lazarus has passed that it's safe to talk about this. Same thing about the woman who anoints Jesus' head or his feet or both. Um, the fact is, it's only safe to mention these figures by name, like Malchus, like Peter, who thrust the sword, long after uh, many of those who directly wanted them dead had either gotten them dead by means of martyrdom or after they had naturally passed. Do you think that's um, a safe and found argument to stand on? Yeah, absolutely, I, I do. Um, uh, what's interesting about the passage you mentioned in, in John 18, as you correctly mentioned, John 18, verse 10, uh, it says that Simon Peter, having drew it, struck off, struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. And John is the only gospel to give us that extraneous detail that uh, the servant's name was was Malchus. That's not found in any of the synoptic gospels. And uh, 
Um, I, the question arises naturally, well, how, how does John know the name of, of the high priest's servant? And you continue reading in verse 26 and 27 of chapter 18 says, one of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, did it not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it and at once a rooster crowed. So again, how does the author of the fourth gospel know that the individual who approached Peter was one of the high priest's servants? It's, it's something that J John seems to be somehow in the know. Um, and then if we read verse 15 and 16 of that same chapter, it says, Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside of the door. Um, so, so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl and kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. Um, and so who, who is this other disciple who's known to the high priest? Well, if we look at um, chapter 20, verse 2 and 3, it says that Mary ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Also in John chapter 19, verse 26, it says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to the mother, wouldn't behold your son. So Peter and the beloved disciple were the ones who the other disciple were the ones that followed Jesus to the cross. Peter, of course, denied the Lord three times and went away uh, uh, weeping because, uh, because of, of the guilt. Uh, and John continued to follow Jesus and was with him right till the end, apparently. And, uh, and so the fact that Jesus, the disciple whom Jesus loved is identified as the one who's standing at the foot of the cross is consistent with the fact that, that he is, the, the same individual as the other disciple, the one who was known to the high priest. And then, in, in, of course, as you know, in John chapter 21, verse 24, it says, it identifies the author saying, this is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And so then this explains how the author came to know the name of the high priest's servant uh, because he, uh, he was someone who was known to the high priest. And, and, that, and that same disciple who was known to the high priest also claims to be the author of the fourth gospel. Right, and so um, that that supports the the authorship of the fourth gospel as being by the disciple whom Jesus loved. And now I would argue that uh, we can make a, a good compelling argument that the that the identity of the disciple whom Jesus loved is in fact John the Evangelist. But that's immaterial. You don't need to make that argument to show that the gospel of John is indeed an eyewitness. Um, furthermore, um, I mean, one objection that Bart Ehrman and other scholars make um, is. That, uh, G, that they claim that John actually denies being the, the disciple whom Jesus loved because actually John seems to distinguish himself from the beloved disciple in John 21, 24. So this is the disciple who's bearing witness about these things and, and who has written these things. And we know that whose testimony is true. Well, who's the we there, right? So is, is, is the we distinguishing themselves from the beloved disciple? Well, if that sentence is distinguishing the author of these words from the beloved disciple, then just these two verses might be a tiny coda to the book that refer to everything else in the book, which was in fact written by the beloved disciple. So just these two verses might uh, may be written by an anonymous person who's authenticating the rest of the book, rather like when the uh, amu, a, um, amu, amu, uh, amuensis, um, the, the scribe in Romans 16, 22, uh, speaks up in a Pauline epistle and sends his greetings. Um, so you've got... Uh, um, so, 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 so that, that's what I, I, I'd say on that. I think that you can make a good argument, as I said, for identifying the beloved disciple as, as, as John. Um, for example, when you examine the places where his record is being present, it reveals that they are particularly, that they are the particular places where the scenes are, um, are recorded with particular vividness and detail, which also supports the author being, being the beloved disciple. Um, for example, um, uh, the conversation at the Last Supper or the scene by the fire at night in the Holy Caiaphas' house. Um, and so there's um, no reason uh, to doubt, in my opinion, that the identification of the beloved disciple with the author of the fourth gospel is correct. Um, and when we look at the lists of those who are present in some of the scenes, uh, including cross-references with the synoptic gospels, he has to have either been Andrew or Peter or James or John. He can't be Andrew since Andrew is named in John's gospel. He can't be Peter since he appears with Peter in the closing chapter. And James was martyred too early to have written the gospel. And so by process of elimination, we arrive at the conclusion that he was most likely John. Um, and, um, uh, um, and, and, and so you've also, as you mentioned, you've got very specific things that, that John the evangelist gets right. 
Um, also in, in first John, which I think we can make a very compelling argument was written by the same author. And that's convinced most scholars that, that first John's gospel and the first epistle of John are written by the same author, even if they deny it's John the evangelist. And how does John, how does the prologue open in, in first John? It says that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes and which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim it to you the eternal life, which was with the father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed our fellowship is with the father and with our, his son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. So uh, the, the author of John's gospel, the same author who wrote 1 John, is claiming to be a direct eyewitness of the things that he, that he writes about. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you're familiar with uh, examples of extra-biblical corroborations and undesigned coincidences, which corroborate and confirm very specific uh, extraneous details that are specific to John, such as the identity of the disciple whom Jesus turned at the feeding of the 5,000 as being Philip in John chapter 6, verse 5, or the, the, the specific time of year. Um, that, that, that it was around the time of Passover, which correlates with Mark 6 and the, the green grass and the people coming and going and so forth. Uh, and also the specific day in which Jesus approached Bethany with the 12 in John chapter 12 as being six days before Passover, only found in John's gospel. And yet we can confirm it by cross-checking with Mark's, uh, Mark chapter 11, counting off the days. Um, it, you've got this undesigned coincidence that confirms that, that extraneous detail in John. Jo John gives us a lot of very specific details uh, in his gospel about... Uh, um, persons, uh, numbers, uh, times of year, um, and um, the, the more specific and detailed marks of date um, in various passages uh, and time of day um, are too numerous and too specific to be the work of someone who's inventing details or passing on oral traditions. And the Gospel of John also overflows with details of objects and scenes that are not found in the other Gospel uh, that are uh, stamped on the memory of the writer, such as um, that the loaves at the feeding of the 5,000 were barley loaves. Uh, when the anointment was poured out for Jesus' anointing, the house was filled with its fragrance in, in chapter 12, verse 3. That uh, in John 12, 13, we were learned that the branches that, are, that were strewn at the triumphal entry in, into Jerusalem were palm branches. In John chapter 13, verse 30, we learned that uh, when Jesus went out to betray Jesus, it was night. Uh, John chapter 19, verse 23, we learn that Jesus' tunic was without seam, woven from the top throughout. So this very specific and vivid description. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 7 says that the head cloth found in the empty tomb was wrapped together in a place by itself. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite common for forgers to avoid giving details, um, as these, especially if they are um, this sort of not readily available as common knowledge, might provide uh, a way for someone to poke a hole in their stories. And so if you browse the Gnostic Gospels, uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, occasionally a very uh, clever or intelligent liar will provide a lot of detail. Um, so this isn't a foolproof uh, principle, but noticing that a, a work contains a great deal of, of, um, of, um, of extraneous detail uh, does, I think, tip the odds uh, in favor of um, authenticity since it narrows the, the types of forgers the author might be. Uh, to one class and, and they're not very numerous. So um, I think cumulatively we have a, a very strong argument for thinking that the, the Gospel of John is authored um, by John the Evangelist uh, from the various points of confirmation and the, the levels of detail that he's familiar with. You also know that the author is, the, the author seems to be part of Jesus' inner circle. Uh, he's, the, the author is familiar with scenes where, on, where only disciples are present, such as their calling in John 1, 19 and following or the journey through Samaria in John 4, um, or the, um, the, the feeding of the 5,000 in John 6, or the visits to Jerusalem in, in chapter 7, 9, and 11. And the, the author also frequently describes their thoughts and feelings and reactions, and he knows both what they said to Jesus and what they said among themselves. And he knows the places where they would go as a group uh, without the company of strangers, and he knows the, the misimpressions that they had that were later corrected. And he, he also knows Jesus' motives and meaning is only one who is intimately acquainted with and could. Um, so as I said, cumulatively, I think we have a very powerful argument for identifying the author as, as John, the son of Zebedee, and that's only the internal evidence, never mind the external evidence, um, which also, I think, points uh, very powerfully uh, that direction. Um, yes, I was going to ask you about the external evidence, because you know, I, I know that Irenaeus, for example, who's the disciple of Polycarp, who's the disciple of John, clearly states that John the Apostle wrote the gospel, uh, maybe with the help of an amanuensis, 
And what's unique is I know Richard Bauckham tries to counter that argument by saying, oh, well, the term apostle is very loose. It could mean even members of the 70. Look, there's even a John the Elder referred to in Papias. Now, I, as you know, I, I strongly believe that we're dealing with John, the son of Zebedee. Um, but if you could just highlight how the term apostle in that one context, given um, Aranesis association with Polycarp, seems to point to only one figure named John who's living in Ephesus, who's living to such a ripe old age. Um, and also to, as you pointed out, um, both the internal evidence. Also, what do you make of, because I know a lot of um, opponents, even Ehrman will go to that fragment from Papias in the second century um, and basically say, oh, well, Papias, uh, by referencing the name John twice is referring to two separate Johns, as Eusebius argues. Although Eusebius is inconsistent in an earlier document called the Chronicle, he says John, the son of Zebedee, um, was in contact with Papias, and Papias did know John personally. So if you could just outline some of the external evidence and also to, you know, some good, I think some very strong rebuttals to some of the, the fogging of the air that, uh, even some uh, evangelical scholars have tried to place in between John and the authorship. Sure, and, and as you said, there, there are some scholars who identify the author of John as John the Elder, and, and there are others, there are some uh, other Christian scholars uh, who would have other identifications. For example, um, argues that Lazarus was the author of the fourth gospel because it says, um, 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 see how he loved him in, in John chapter 11. Um, and uh, as you said, uh, the, the idea of making a distinction between John the Apostle and John the Elder is, is also, also something that you find. Uh, Richard Balcom, for example, in Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, identifies the author of the fourth gospel with John the Elder. Um, I, and I agree with your line of thinking. I, I, would, I, I don't see any reason to, to take John the Elder and John the Apostle to be a separate person uh, even if that is the case i mean even richard balcom thinks that john the elder was an eyewitness so um uh, but but I, I i would i would identify john the apostle and john the elder as one of the same when we look at the patristic support um Tertullian of carthage uh tell um, in again his against marcion says of the apostles therefore john and matthew first and still faith unto us while of apostolic men luke and mark renew it afterwards so he identifies uh, the author of the gospel is John. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, you mentioned, in Against Heresies, uh, book through chapter three, he says, John, the disciple of the Lord, who also had leaned upon his breast, did himself publish a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. And Irenaeus also frequently quotes from John's gospel by name. And uh, John, Irenaeus was um, self-confessedly a disciple of Polycarp. He, according to Irenaeus, was a disciple of John the Apostle. And so Irenaeus was only one person removed from, um, from John the Apostle. Um, and so it seems that if, if Irenaeus identifies uh, John as the author of the fourth gospel, then I think that's, that's good from a fancy reason to take that seriously. Also, Clement of Alexandria, in his still extant writings, makes several mentions of the gospel according to John and, and quotes from it. Um, and, uh, and so Craig Keener, in his commentary on the Gospel of John, says that consonant with what we find from the internal evidence, church tradition identifies the author of the fourth gospel with the Apostle of John. And, uh, um, um, D. A. Car and Don Carson, uh, in his commentary on the Gospel according to John, he says, we have already traced the principal external evidence, i.e. evidence outside the fourth gospel itself, that maintains the evangelist was none other than the Apostle John, son of Zebedee. That evidence, such as it is, is virtually unanimous. Even if Irenaeus, towards the end of the second century, is amongst the strongest, totally unambiguous witnesses, his personal connection with Polycarp, who knew John, means the distance in terms of personal memories is not very great. Even Don, who discounts the view that the Apostle of John wrote the fourth gospel, considers the external evidence formidable, adding, of any external evidence to the contrary that could be called cogent, I am not aware. Um, so, and, and note is also the geographical spread of this attestation, right? You, you've got this unanimous tradition, and you've got Tertullian, Carthage in North Africa, you've got Irenaeus of Lyon, you've got Gaul, what we know as France, Clement of Alexandria in Egypt, um, and, um, and, and so you've got this, this wide geographical spread and a unanimity of tradition. There's no competing authorship tradition for John or any of the other four Gospels. And so when you put the internal evidence together with the external evidence, I think you have a very powerful um, two-pronged cumulative argument 
that uh, that the that the author of the fourth gospel is indeed John the Evangelist. And, and I think in regards to then the Johannine statements, because um, often I think I forget whether it was Lacona or whether it was Evans who argued. Well, even if we could prove that John was the author, and I, I think as you excellently put, I, I think the overwhelming evidence for apostolic authorship is undeniable. Um, they claim that that doesn't determine the genre. Now, for me, with geographical place names intact, with incidental details spread throughout, um, and the presentation of the text, where even the dialogues, even if they're in a polished uh, rabbinical style, uh, it does still seem to point to John's gospel being presented as a historical uh, presentation, not merely an idealistic one. Um, I don't think we have any evidence in first century Judea of things like the Platonic dialogues uh, about Socrates. Also too, there seems to be no incentive for John the Zebedee, son of, son of Zebedee, to have written an extensive parable when people's primary interest would have been on about what historically occurred on the ground. That seems to be first and foremost. Uh, I was wondering if um, we could point to also to any evidence that, that you would suggest that would also discount some of the arguments presented by Bart Ehrman, uh, where he tries to claim that John the Apostle was martyred earlier around the time of James in the 50s or 60s. Um, and he makes this argument, I think, on the basis of George the Sinner, who is a, a fourth century patristic father, and one other who claimed that they got evidence from uh, the martyrdom of John from Papias. The, the reason why I discount this is if you look at those fragments that have survived that supposedly say that John was killed by um, those who were following uh, post, sorry, pre-70 pre AD uh, Judaism, is the fact that these sources are very, very late. And there seems to be a stronger unanimous opinion of John naturally passing in Ephesus. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to that in, in light of, I think, very strong uh, patristic evidence for uh, John's lengthy survival. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Uh, and uh, the, the consensus of scholarship, and I think the evidence indicates as well that John it didn't die as a martyr, but he, he died uh, on the Isle of Patmos as an exile. And uh, I, even if that argument did carry some weight, I, I still don't think that uh, it undermines significantly the the case for the authorship of the fourth gospel because the the for, as for as is the case for all four gospels the evidence bearing on the dating is not at all um conclusive um and in fact uh, dan wallace uh, dates the gospel of john to the 50s ad uh, and although most scholars date it to between 1995 ad you can make a case that uh, the Gospel of John may even be pre-70. Um, for example, in, if you look, and John Walsh are in a paper on this, if you look at John chapter 5, um, it's, it's uh, in verse uh, 2, it says, Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, um, and, uh, which has five roof colonnades. Uh, and uh, these, along with the rest of the temple, were destroyed in AD 70. Uh, and so if, if John is using the present tense there, that suggests that he, he was writing prior to that destruction. Um, and uh, I mean, people make this sort of argument. I've heard people make this argument, sort of argument against the traditional authorship of all four gospels that, okay, the, the, the longevity of life, the, the lifespans in first century Judea were quite short. Um, and um, even if it were the case, uh, that would just be an argument, in my opinion, for the gospels being written earlier than we previously thought, uh, because I don't think that the dating for the dating of, I don't think the argument for the dating of the gospels is very strong. Um, and furthermore, we have evidence of people living to quite old ages, like Josephus, for example, uh, was born 36 and died 180. Uh, we, we, and Polycarp of Smyrna um, famously said, 86 years I have served Christ. He never did me any wrong. Had then can I bless you, my king and savior, when he was confronted with the prospect of martyrdom, etc. Uh, so, um, I, I, I just, I don't find that sort of style of argument very convincing. Definitely. Um, me neither. Honestly, I, I think that makes perfectly good sense. Uh, one last question before we wrap up for today. Uh, what would you make of the testimony of Ignatius of Antioch and maybe some pre-70 AD references to the Gospel of John as well? Uh, we know that uh, Polycarp, um, it seems to have been 
a contemporary of uh, John the uh, Apostle, as was Ignatius to some, uh, some point. And Irenaeus claims that Polycarp knew apostles in the plural. We know that according to later church tradition in the fourth century and third century, that Ignatius of Antioch was uh, personally ordained uh, by Peter and that he had contact with John the Apostle. Now, while this tradition is very late, Irenaeus seems to make a reference back to a period where Polycarp knew many apostles in the plural. So that, that does seem to suggest that Ignatius of Antioch had contact with both Peter and John. Uh, also, too, what would you make of, uh, for example, in Peter, uh, he says of the disciples, though they have not seen Jesus, they love Jesus. This seems to be a reference back to John chapter 20, the words of Jesus uh, to Thomas, blessed are those who have not seen, but believe. So that seems to hinge on some references. Um, same thing with First uh, uh, Timothy, where Paul makes the uh, remarkable statement that uh, Timothy should make a good confession, like the confession Jesus made before Pontius Pilate. Well, that confession only appears in uh, John chapter 18, where Jesus says, I have come uh, to testify of the truth. All who hear the truth, all who are of the truth, hear my voice. So there does seem to be nuggets of references back to Johannine like statements, uh, such as being born again in 1 Peter, that seem to hinge of some awareness of Johannine statements before 70 AD, perhaps suggesting that uh, parts of the Gospel of John certainly were written. Uh, long before they were finally codified, whether it was in the 50s or the 90s. Right, indeed. Um, and uh, as for Ignatius, uh, I, I, I think he's, uh, he, I think it's very probable that he was personally acquainted with the with the apostles. Um, and uh, he was, of course, a companion of Polycarp. One of his letters is addressed to Polycarp of Smyrna. And we know from Irenaeus that he was a, that Irenaeus was a disciple, uh, that Polycarp was a disciple of John. Um, and so uh, it's very plausible, I think, that Ignatius knew John, uh, although uh, I don't believe there are any explicit statements uh, in any sources that indicate that he knew specifically John, um, but certainly that he, he was one of the apostolic fathers and that he knew the apostles. Um, and uh, and, and uh, so, yeah, and, and Ignatius is very, has a very high Christology as well. He, very many passages you could cite in his seven letters where he affirms the deity of Christ. Uh, and uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that absolutely answers. You know, because mostly what it comes down to is I, I think it's very wise to suggest he knew John. I know a lot of the tradition says he also knew Peter and they tried to make the claim, oh, well, uh, essentially it, it's way too late for a source to have known Peter. Peter is martyred in the 60s. Um, essentially Polycarp was only still a young man. But I, I can imagine him as a, a neophyte, at least in that period. And the fact that Irenaeus says that Polycarp knew apostles in the plural, that suggests to me that perhaps um, Ignatius also knew apostles in the plural. Uh, because if it applied to Polycarp, and he's a stone's throw away from where Ignatius was in Asia Minor, that seems to suggest that both could apply. And if both could apply, and Ignatius quotes from all four canonical gospels and has the same Christology as Orthodox Christianity as understood for two millennia, uh, that Jesus is true God and true man, then that seems to then be a slam dunk on those who want to say that there's this slow development. I mean, Ignatius is, along with the internal evidence of the New Testament, um, basically seems to help validate uh, all the I am statements in, in a single go, because he, he'll make radical statements of self-identification of Jesus that seem to come straight from the horse's mouth, which seems to suggest that he has some contact with John and at least some Petrine memory. Mm, very possible, yeah. All right, well, John, I want to thank you for an amazing interview today. I want to thank you for all your time and for allowing this to happen because, you know, in light of uh, Lacona's video series, um, in opposition to McGrew's thesis, I find that um, more defense of the authority of the scripture as McCrew has beautifully done and has beautifully illustrated is, is deeply required. And that means examining the evidence and seeing, of course, where it leads, but 
of course, examining these sources and recognizing, I think as both you and Dr. Lydia McGrew and both uh, her and Tim McGrew do that, when we're dealing with these sources, we're dealing with credible eyewitness testimony. And that when Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh to the Father except by me, we can rely and trust that it, around 32 or 33 AD, the master, our Lord, actually said those words. And for that, John, and for all the work you do on Apologetics Academy, and for your doctoral work, and for your current MA work, know that you will continue to be in my prayers and in all my intercession in Christ. Well, thanks so much, John. Thanks for having me on. Great honor, always. Always.